Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning. Good morning. All right. We are in a series. We've been in a series for, oh, I don't know, about eight weeks. We're working through this acrostic of disciple. We've been in John, the book of John, towards the end of John, where Jesus is telling his disciples, these 12 men that have been with him for roughly three years or so, they've seen a lot of cool stuff. They've done a lot of cool stuff. And now Jesus is about to head to the cross. And in John chapters 12 through 16, Jesus begins to give them some final instructions, some teaching. He does this around the Last Supper and, and some things that enter into that. He does this as he's raising Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. He does this through uh, as the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders are, are coming up to him and trying to trick him with questions and different things. And, and here's what I know. If you walk with the, the God of the universe for three years, and then he tells you, which they forgot, obviously, when it happened, but then he tells you that he's about to go to Jerusalem and be um, crucified. I'm going to listen to whatever it is he has to say before that happens. Because he's basically setting them up to carry on his ministry. And as we've been walking through this, we've used this word disciple because all of us are disciples of Jesus. If we're believers in Christ, we are disciples of Jesus. That means Jesus is our master and we've committed our lives to following him. And so we looked at death to self. We've looked at what it means to die to self and follow Jesus. We looked at imitating the God that we profess to serve. We, we looked at what it looks like to serve others. And we actually looked at that passage at that last supper where Jesus was washing the feet of not only the 11 men that would carry the gospel to the nations of the world, but also the one that would ultimately betray him. We looked at committed love and what that looks like for us as disciples to love our families and to love other Christians and also to love the people of the world that we come in contact with. Impacting faith the presence of the Holy Spirit, and then last week, lasting fruit. And today we close it out with enduring faith. And yes, I'm wearing a t-shirt that says, finish empty. A buddy of mine that preached at Reach Camp this last year, this is his ministry, finish empty, all you got every day. And I'm wearing this on purpose because we're talking about enduring faith, a faith that lasts. 
And you know, I was on the zero turn mower for four hours yesterday. First mow of the season. Nothing but weeds, y'all. All All right, you know those big yellow flowers that grow up that my daughter thinks are so beautiful, but they're a pain in the you know what. All right, and you got to mow all that down. And I have some awesome, I mean, it's like God, I think God loves the zero turn mower because I get so much insight as I've got my ear pods in, my iPad, and I'm listening to Christian music, or I'm listening to a devotional, or I'm listening to the Bible, and sometimes I'll just turn it off, and I'll just marinate on whatever it is, whatever season I'm in, whatever's going on. And well, yesterday it was this message, and God spoke to me on the zero turn of all places, and he reminded me of a very important truth that I want to remind us of today, because when we look at this series, some of this stuff's been pretty tough. I mean, death to self, right? Serving others, even our enemies, that's tough. Committed love, I mean, all of this. And then God reminded me of this. He said, these are just marks of a growing Christian, You're never going to reach perfection. And I don't know why he has to keep reminding me of that. I should know that by now because I know myself pretty well and Edward's agreeing, so I guess I'm not perfect. Yeah, okay, green for you. These are just marks of a growing Christian. Do we die to self every day the way Jesus calls us to in Scripture? I don't. Am I imitating Christ every second, every minute of every day? Probably not. Am I serving others the way Jesus served Judas that night at the, law, at the Last Supper? Is my committed love one that you would look at and say, man, that's just like Jesus? Probably not. And so I'm reminded this morning that although I may not have all of these nailed down, I'm a little better today than I was 15, 16 years ago when I started this journey. That I look a little bit more like Jesus in the eye than I did, say, three or four or five years ago. That my decision making when it comes to death to self, what I want versus what he wants, a little better today than it was when this journey started, that I actually do serve others, maybe not the way Jesus did, but it's a little better today than it was, say, 10 years ago. And so if you're like me and you look and you read the red letters, you know, there's the red letters in the scripture, the gospels where Jesus is talking. We have the red letters that we like to read, and then we have the red letters that, oh, that hurts. How would I ever live up to that? You won't. That's what the gospel is all about. But if we can strive to be just a little bit better, not because we're trying to earn something, but because we actually love the God that spoke all of this, then he can be glorified. And that was just reminded to me yesterday as we come up to this last teaching point that Jesus wanted his disciples to really grasp, enduring faith. Um, So about, I don't know, we used to live in Holly Lake. We don't live there anymore, but we used to live in Holly Lake. We bought this little old house in Holly Lake, and it was a new construction house. It was gray, and it had these rails on it that were, you know, wood color, same color as, you know, that you buy at the lumber store or whatever. And so I had this great idea that, hey, that would really look cool because Ashley has this fascination with like red door, yellow door, turquoise, like the color of our door changes about as often as we change diets. I mean, it's just one day you come to our house, it's the house with the red door. And the next time it's like, I thought your door was red. Well, it was, now it's yellow. So in this house, she wanted a red door with white trim. So I got the great idea, well, let's just paint the whole deck white. Man, that'll look awesome, all right? Now, if you've ever seen a deck, you know they have, you know, every so many inches apart, and you construction people will know exactly how, what the code is. I really don't care. I just know there's a lot of them. (laughs) And so if you're going to paint white, you've got to paint not just the top or the sides. You've got to paint all these rails in between, too. There's like hundreds of them. And our house is like, or that house was like seven feet off the ground. And so to get to the other side, you had to lean over and paint like this. Now, here's the deal. 
We did, we did that one Memorial Day weekend. I overheated and got sick. Two years later, after people would continually say, why is your deck half painted? Because it looked like I'd put primer on it. If you've ever just put primer on something and walked away, it doesn't look good. Two years, Ashley finally looked at me and said, are you ever going to finish the rails? I guess. <laughs> Funny thing is, is I find this to be a pattern in my life. And the people that know me best can testify, I love to start stuff. Starting stuff is fun. I can put my feet up on my desk and I can dream about what could be. Yeah. And I'll actually take a step of faith and start it. I just have a hard time finishing things. Like I'll have this idea in my house that we need to do like this garden thing in the back or this great little landscape with flowers and stuff. And so I'll get up one Saturday and I'll start to kind of piece that together. And then a year later, after Ashley is tired of looking at it, she finally makes me finish. Sometimes I'll just dream about stuff and tell people what's going to happen, and then I never even start it to finish. But on those occasions, and there are occasions where I do finish something, it's like, like I'm a man. I finish that. Like, look how good those rails look after three years. Because it took me another year after I came back to start to finally finish it. But when I finish something, there's that sense of, you know, that good kind of pride that comes up and says, man, look what I did. Feels good to accomplish something. Feels good to finish. Now, you may be like me. You may be a dreamer, you may be a visionary, you may be somebody that likes to start but doesn't finish. You may not be like me. You may be uh, like a lot of people that I surround myself with strategically because they're executors, they're doers. So I can talk, dream, cast, and even start, and they'll actually come behind me and finish, all right? That's their gift. You may be one of those people. But I think if we were honest with ourselves... There are things in our lives that we start and we don't finish. How many of you are still hitting your New Year's resolution? One person. Out of a, Edward, really? I'm proud of you, bro. Good job. Yeah, so we all start things that we don't finish. But finishing is huge. Finishing well is even better. See, I, I've been known to finish but not finish well. I've been known to jog a couple of miles and get down to that last quarter mile, and it's not a jog anymore. It's more of a like a, you know, I finished, but I didn't finish well. I remember when I transitioned out of bivocational ministry into full-time ministry back in 2008 when y'all called me to be a full-time service. I remember I, I'd put in like a three weeks notice at my old place and the people that I worked for were great. They were like family. In about a week and a half, it was very obvious to everybody, dude, you're not finishing well here. Like you're here physically, but you're mine. And they were Christian people and they were all for what I was about to do. And so we actually sat down after about a week and a half into my three week notice and they released me. It's like, you're, it, no, it's true. Because there are times where even though I was committed to finishing, I really wasn't finishing well. And so what I want to talk to you today about is finishing well. Finishing empty. Everything you've got. Every day. Until the Lord calls you home. Now there's three reasons I find that I don't finish and we'll see if these fit for anybody here. Sometimes I don't finish because I'm just flat out lazy. I don't want to do it. Sometimes I don't finish because I get bored. Maybe what I started is just not satisfying anymore. Maybe it was a great idea to begin with. I get halfway into it and my heart's just not in it. Nah, that was a stupid idea anyway. So I just stop. Sometimes I don't finish because it's just too dang hard. I didn't count the cost. I didn't know what it was going to take. 
I didn't know the financial burden. I didn't know the cost on my body. I didn't know the cost emotionally. I didn't know the cost mentally. And so I just stop. When we talk about enduring faith, and we look at what it means to endure, the word literally means in the definition, our American definition, is to continue It's a long-lasting word. It means long-lasting over a period of time that you continue. And here's the deal. There really is no end. And so even though we're talking about finishing in this context, it's almost like, yeah, there is a finish line, but it's a finish line that we really can't comprehend Because we know as believers that the Lord is coming back for us, but we don't know what that looks like. And so we have this calling in our life to endure until that happens. And so it's almost like a forever thing, like a continuing, a long-lasting journey. You know, it's interesting, when I was in youth ministry, I used to tell students all the time, it was like, isn't it interesting that the day I got saved, the day that my ticket to heaven was punched, that I didn't just die on the spot. That 16, almost 17 years later, I'm still here. And I think for many of us, we had this idea, and Mark almost preached my sermon after one of those songs uh, earlier in the worship set, that we have this idea that we get saved and we get our ticket punch, and then we just kind of come and we hang out and do the church deal for a while and we see what happens. And that's not why we're here. We've been called to do many things. We've been called to live a life that, that glorifies Jesus, to put him before us, to imitate him, to serve him, to commit to love, to impact people and nations and communities with our faith, to have the Holy Spirit in our life that guides us to have lasting fruit and then to endure and to do this until he calls us home. If you have your Bibles in John chapter 15, I'm not going to have a lot of this on the screen. I'll let you know when something pops up on the screen. But in John chapter 15, I want to start in verse 18, because after Jesus gives this, these teachings and all of this stuff is woven in there, he starts to say some very interesting things. In verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. If you are of the world, the world would love you because you're not of the world, but because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. He says, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, guess what? They're going to persecute you as well. If they had kept my word, they would also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of me in my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. Now they have no excuse. Verse 23, whoever hates me hates the Father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated, they hate both me and my Father. And then in verse 25, he says, But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. Now he's talking about prophecy is about to be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. He spends the rest of chapter 15 talking about he's going to send the Holy Spirit, a comforter that will guide them and will be with them and will remind him of the teaching and all these different things. And so we get to this part of, hey, I'm about to go to the cross And here's what you need to know. You will be hated. You will be hated. You will be hated because I was hated. He's beginning to paint a picture of trials, tribulation, hardship, persecution. And then in verse 16, he says, Now I have told you all these things, listen to this, to keep you from falling away. I am warning you of all this, and I'm telling you all of this because I want you to endure, is basically what he's saying. I have told you all this to keep you from falling away. Verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, a time is coming 
when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God. So now he's gone from you're going to be hated to implying you're going to be killed. And then he starts telling them, and this is where they get really confused. He starts telling them, you know, for a little while you'll see me, then you'll see me no longer, then you'll see me again, and then you'll see me no longer. And they're like, what are you talking about? Basically, hey, I'm going away, but I'm sending the comforter. I'm sending the spirit. You will glorify me in the spirit. All of this stuff that we've been talking about, that spirit in you, as you do these things, you will glorify me. He says, you'll see me then not see me, then see me, yada, yada, yada. Then he closes this awesome sermon, this feel-good, joyful sermon with this in verse 32. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone for the Father is with me, and I have said these things to you that you may have peace. What? In the world you will have tribulation, he says. You think? But then he closes with, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has given his disciples a charge, a challenge, a, uh, and it's some encouragement that in the midst of persecution... In the midst of trials, in the midst of tribulation, they will have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit and through everything that they have learned and through who God is in them, they will have the power to endure. They will have the power to finish. They will have the power to continue. And if you read the book of Acts and you study early church history, you know what they had to endure. Floggings, beatings, being arrested, being starved, on the run, running from town to town, scared to death, and yes, even being martyred or killed for their faith. And isn't it interesting that 2,000 years later, we stand here today because 11 men continued. 11 men endured. And those 11 went to about 450 really quick. And then to about 500, 600, and then that went to 3,000 really, really quick. And churches began to spring up. And then when Saul got converted... And Paul began to preach along the known world, churches popping up everywhere. But for a while, this is what they had to endure. Persecution, trials, tribulation. And yet we stand here 2,000 years later because a group of men and women continued. Continued what Jesus had started. Endured finished, and finished well. You see, I'm thinking about this, and I'm reading all this, and I'm thinking, God, what is this? How does this fit for us? Because up until this point, I get death to self. I get the imitation. I get the serving. All of this stuff is pretty practical. But then I get to the E, and I read what you had to say in 15 and 16. And in the good old U.S. of A., in the good old Southern Bible Belt, I'm not being flogged. I'm not being chased from town to town. My children are not being taken from my home. My wife is not being taken from my home. I'm not being drugged through the streets of Holly Lake. My friends are not being hung upside down. And yet I know I have a calling on my life, and yet I know all of us have a calling in our lives to finish and to endure. So what does that look like for us? And then I begin to think about trials. I begin to think about sickness. I begin to think about emotional pain. I begin to think about condemnation from good old religious folk when we don't measure up. I begin to think about sin in my life that I have yet to conquer. Yes, you heard me say that, yet to conquer. 
and the condemnation that comes with that. I begin to think of those that have wayward children and it just breaks your heart. Maybe you've lost a child. You can't even imagine what that must be like. I've sat with families where that's happened. I've sat with teens where mom and dad are going through a divorce or I've sat with teens that just weren't wanted. I've sat with adults. And yes, our trials and our tribulations are not the same, but they're real. And the pain that can come from any one of these could cause us to say, you know what? I don't even want to bother. If that's what painting the rails is like, I'm out. Too lazy. Or maybe we just get to the point where we just say, it's too hard. I'm too hurt. I've been hurt by the church. Some of us, and I've been here in good old U.S. of A., Southern Bible Belt Christianity, we just get bored because we don't understand that if we were doing these things, there would be a group of people that actually hated us. And so we play it safe. All of it causes us to question. We begin to question whether it's really worth it. We begin to question whether, you know, we should continue. And bold statement, a lot of us in the American church don't finish. We check out. It's too boring. It's not exciting enough. It's not fun. I don't even want to go there. It's too hard. I tried it. It didn't work. I got hurt, so I'm out. And the, I've done it, y'all. I've been there. And then I'm thinking about 11 guys. If anybody had a reason to quit, it was those men if anybody had a reason to quit, it was the women of the early church that would watch their husbands and their children be persecuted. If anybody had a reason to quit, it was those people. Yet here we are 2,000 years later because they finished. And they finished well. And so then I asked myself the question, okay, so what do I do? You know, what does this look like? Because it's one thing for me, as Edward always likes to say, pull myself up by my bootstraps and just finish. Well, I tried that. Tried that in my last job. You heard that. It didn't go so well. I mean, I want to be inspired by the words of Jesus, not condemned. I want to finish because, to me, it brings glory to God. You know, I want to live a life of death to self. I want to live a life of imitating Jesus. I want to live a life of serving to others. I don't want to do all this to please him, per se. I don't want to do all this so I can check off a box. I don't want to do all this because he, so that, that he'll love me or accept me. Because if I believe my own BS, he already does love me and accept me. I want to do these things because it'll bring him glory. I've been bored. I've been at the place of defeat. I'm walking through a season right now where some things in my life are just too hard. I've been lazy. I don't want to be that. I'm 44 years old. Most of the people in my family, 75, 80-ish, got a good 30 years maybe left. I want to finish. What does that look like? Well, I begin to do some reading. And where I want to end this series with Enduring Faith, I want to take it a little turn. Because I could sit here and challenge you all day long. And I could sit here and I can inspire you all day long that you personally finish well. That you keep the faith, that you endure. But if you're like me, and there's nothing in it for you, <laughs> just being honest, you could check out. Like, really, what's at stake? Well, let me tell you what's at stake. 
I think one of the most important commands that we find in Scripture actually comes from the Apostle Paul. And it's one of those verses. This is not on a sign in anybody's kitchen. This is not on, anybody, this is not on a bumper sticker. It is rarely, if ever, preached. But it is so huge. In 2 Timothy, Paul's writing... Y'all know who Paul is? Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was Saul. He persecuted Christians. He um, killed them. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. He got saved. It says he spent a few days learning the ways of the faith of the disciples, and he immediately began to preach Jesus, so anti-Jesus, to preach in Jesus. And then he spent his entire life going from town to town, starting churches. He would start a church. He would raise up pastors and elders, and then he would leave. And he would go do it all over again. And then when he was in prison, he had this great idea that while he was in prison, he would start writing letters to all of these pastors and all of these churches that he had started, that he had mentored. Timothy was very special to him. Timothy was a young, up-and-coming, awesome believer. And so he, he poured a lot into Timothy. I mean, he loved everybody that he came in contact with, but Timothy was a little special. So he poured a lot into Timothy. And so he begins to write a second letter. He'd already written one. He begins to write a second letter to Timothy. And in verse 1, he starts reminding Timothy, very similar to what Jesus was doing with the disciples before he left. He starts reminding Timothy about his sincere faith. You can go back and read it you know, later. But he talks about how proud he was and how um, he gives thanks to God every time he thinks about Timothy. He talks about Timothy's grandmother, who was a solid Christian and probably had a lot of influence on Timothy. We don't know for sure, but I mean, two plus two equals four probably happened. And so he's reminding Timothy of his sincere faith. And then he starts challenging him a little bit. He, he makes statements like, fan into flame the gift of God. Y'all have heard that verse? The famous 1 Timothy 1.7 is in this passage. He says, you know, God did not give you a spirit of fear. He's reminding him. He gave you a spirit of power, love, self-control. Some versions say a sound mind. He tells Timothy, he reminds Timothy, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of it. Reminds him that the Holy Spirit dwells within us and is like a guaranteed deposit of our salvation. So he's, he's reminding Timothy of a lot of very important things that every, every believer should, should know and be reminded of. Number one, he encourages him about a sincere faith. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Challenges him to fan into flame that gift, that fire that burned with you in those early days. How, those of you that are believers, you remember the early days when you read the whole Bible in one night and preached to all your brothers and sisters, told them they were going to hell, that they needed to convert and receive Jesus. You preached at everybody at work, okay? Those early days where that fire was burning. He was reminding Timothy, don't ever let that go out. Fan that baby, ignite it. And then he reminds him, God, you, you know, didn't give you a spirit of fear. Why would he do that? Because we, be, we get afraid, don't we? Don't be ashamed. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. And then here it is. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He just says, hey, I'm reminding you of all these things. Now I want to tell you just, hey, be strengthened. And then here it is. This is one of the most important commands you will ever get as a believer. Verse 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You ever wonder how Christianity, our faith, has endured for over 2,000 years in the midst of of persecution in the midst of trials, in the midst of tribulation. You ever wonder? What in the internet? What in TV? 
it was because the believers of that day and every day since, some of them anyway, took to heart the enduring of the gospel. The gospel endures. You and I may quit, but the gospel endures. It may get too hard for me and you, but the gospel will endure. We may get lazy, but the gospel will endure. We may get bored with our American version of Christianity, but the gospel will endure. And you want to know how the gospel endures? It endures when I hear from somebody that's a little bit wiser and a little bit smarter than me the teachings and all of the wisdom that they've learned from Christ, and then I pass that on to whoever is below me, my children, my grandchildren, the people in my ministry, and then they in turn are able to teach others. That's how the gospel and that's how you and I endure. We finish this race and we finish well by passing the torch from generation to generation to generation. There's a you, there's a me, there's others, and then there's others. Four generations, probably 150 years plus of the gospel being passed down in one verse. Everything I've told you, Timothy, entrust that to faithful men who will then be able to teach others. Paul, Timothy, Timothy's church, and us 2,000 years later. The gospel endures when you and I take this command seriously. Here's the problem. We do and we will have a temptation to check out. And this is where I want to land the plane today. And I want to challenge the snot out of you. Women, you got a great event coming up Friday. And you may be working Friday. You may not get off till 5 o'clock. For 10 bucks, 15 bucks, that all it is, register anyway and come Friday night and Saturday. It's a great way to connect. It's a great way for you to learn. It's a great way for you to pass on what you may know. Do you realize everybody should have somebody in their life that is farther along in the journey and somebody in their life that is not? You take and you give. You learn and you teach. That's how we endure by passing this gospel from generation to generation to generation. Men, you got your shin guards on? It's time. We are the leaders and the pastors of our homes. We have been called. Now we may not wanna answer the phone, But we have been called as Christian men to lead in three areas. I am convinced of this. I see it in Scripture. We have been called to lead in our families first, our churches second, and our communities third. What I see more and more in the American church is that men have begun to take a back seat By nature, we can make excuses and we can become lazy, we can become bored, and we can convince ourselves it's just too dang hard. And if every one of us decided to check out, what happens to the next generation? I'm so excited on April 6th We're actually going to be gathering here. We had a change of plans with venue. But here on April 6th, it's a Saturday. 
I've been working with a group of men for a couple of months now, and we've been putting together what I believe is the biggest vision casting we have ever done to our men. And I'm just going to go ahead and warn you, because I know in previous men's days, we've shot guns, we've gone fishing, uh, we've played horseshoes and um, oh, whatever that thing is with the bean bags. We've done a lot of golf, we've done golf. And we'll have a day like that in August. Curtis Grimes is bringing his band in August, and we'll go out to the land, and we'll do all of that stuff. But in two weeks, on April the 6th, we are going to gather as a group of men, and there will be red meat. We're working on a fire indoors. Edward says he can handle it. He's even considering building a pond back there. And we are going to answer three questions that every man in this church, I'm not picking on women. You know why I'm not picking on women? Because y'all got this figured out. <laughs> We're going to answer three questions. Who are we? What trips us up? And what is it we're supposed to be doing? And then we're going to give you an opportunity to get involved. We've been working behind the scenes of launching some new ministries for our men. And all of that's going to be casted on that Saturday. Why is this important, men? Because we have been called to take what we have heard from those and pass it on and entrust it to faithful men who will then teach others. Men, if you're young, you've got a lot of learning to do, but you've also got a lot of giving to do. If you're my age, I'll be 45 next month. If you're my age, you're, at least I am, I'm, I'm starting to look 30 years I mean, my next 30 years, I think that song is. What is this going to look like? I need to have multiple of these men in my life. So I can consume, 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 consume. And then I need to be going out to everybody that I can find of these younger guys and pour and pour and pour and pour and pour. If you are in, as my friend Joe Smith likes to say, a later stage of life, you're not done. Nowhere in Scripture is there a retirement from the faith or from serving or from pouring into the next generation. We need you. I can't do what I do. Edward can't do what he does without you. We need you to step up and get involved. So I'm challenging you today, men, I'm challenging you today, faithful disciple of Jesus. We have been called to endure. Let's finish the race. Let's pray. Well, Father, you're good. I didn't sleep a wink last night, and you just spoke this message energetically, and I give you praise and glory for that. God, may we, number one, may we just rest in your grace, in your goodness. May we know that nothing we do will ever change how you feel about us. If we never answer the call, we're still secure in you. But God, help us to understand what this means for the next generation and for the gospel the men and women that live in our communities that we work with, that we go to school with, that desperately need to see you glorified. And God, ignite in us a passion to follow you. And so God, as we do this thing called Christianity, may you and you alone be glorified. May you and you alone do the work that you called us to do in us, Father. And may we be people that give you glory. We love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before you get out of here, women, 
there is a table right outside this door that's been there for three weeks. You can go there and register today. Men, this is so easy. All right, get on the interwebs. Go to summitheightsfellowship.com. There's a big banner, or, there's, or if you're on a phone, it's down at the bottom. You just click on that Men's Day logo. I need your name, your email, your age. That is it, and then you are registered. If you have trouble with that, I'll be at the IGC, which is the info desk. I'll have my computer there, and we can sign you up on the spot. I love you. Let's go be Jesus. All right. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.